I'm Jerome Rhodes. Uh, my last book is Why Not Default, The Political Economy of Sovereign Debt. Yeah, I was going to go to the U.S. to present my book at a number of conferences, including at Columbia University, and uh, to give a talk on your show. And that was actually, that was the thing I was most looking forward to. Uh, and unfortunately, I couldn't make it uh, for the very simple and sad reason that I wasn't allowed into the United States, because the Department of Homeland Security apparently considered me to be too big a risk factor because I had previously traveled to Iraq. And the reason that I traveled to Iraq is because my partner um, was working there um, uh, as, a, as a humanitarian worker uh, with refugee communities and internally displaced communities, uh, obviously a long-term consequence of a war that the United States itself instigated. Uh, so there's a, a double sort of irony to this situation. Uh, but apparently this is part of uh, Trump's travel ban um, that doesn't just target people who are actually from those countries, but also people who have traveled uh, into those countries. One of the questions that I'm really interested in at the moment, uh, after carrying out research on financial crises um, spanning you know, centuries, in fact, is uh, where we might be headed and what might be the next financial crisis coming along. And my sense is that that next financial crisis, when it does come along, is going to be significantly worse than anything we've experienced so far. And part of the reason for that is that every crisis basically unfolds on a new terrain. And it unfolds on a terrain that was largely shaped by the way that governments responded to the previous crisis. And the way that they responded to the last crisis of 2008 was really by trying to prop up uh, the debt economy that we've built up over the past 40 years. And uh, prop that up in a way that actually solves the problem of too much debt with even more debt. And obviously that may buy some more time uh, for the existing financial system to sort of reproduce itself and to continue existing in the way that it does. Uh, but eventually it's going to lead to problems that are very similar to the ones that we've seen uh, break out a lot in the 1980s debt crisis in the developing world, for instance, or the emerging market debt crises of the 1990s, or the housing crisis, uh, the real estate uh, crisis of uh, 2008. Uh, that broke out initially in the United States and then spread to Europe and the globe and became this huge financial confl conflagration. Yeah. I mean, to a very large extent, finance tends to obfuscate its own internal workings by making it sound much more complex, uh, what they're doing, than what's really going on. I think what's really going on is an organized system of robbery, whereby uh, gargantuan sums of money are being funneled from working people towards uh, financiers and uh, towards really an oligarchy of extremely rich billionaires and um, very well remunerated traders at the major uh, Wall Street financial institutions. And I think that this process uh, has been going on for 40 years, uh, maybe a bit longer, starting in the 1970s. Uh, and it's been radicalized in the wake of the global financial crisis. And obviously what we noticed in the global financial crisis is that we were, as sort of the left and as a social movement, we were kind of taken by surprise we thought that that model was imploding. We thought that the 2008 moment signified that finance could no longer do the kind of things it had been doing ever since the 70s and 80s. Uh, but actually what it did is it doubled down with the assistance of, of policymakers and financial officials and monetary officials. It doubled down on these, uh, on these organized, uh, on this organized process of robbery and dispossession. Uh, I think that what's necessary for us to begin sort of countering that tendency is to really build the kind of social power from below that in the next moment of crisis can begin to deflect some of the costs of adjustment for that next crisis onto those very people who caused it to begin with. And that is of course the precise opposite of what has been happening for the past decade because that's the people who actually caused the crisis getting away unscathed every time and managing to push the costs of the crisis onto those who were least able, uh, well least responsible for causing it and least able to resist uh, uh, this situation, this state of affairs. At the moment, our movements are not sort of advanced enough and powerful enough to begin to threaten the organized privilege of the 1%, if you will, of, of, and the structural power of finance as, as, as a class and as a system. Uh, but what I do think is that we are moving towards a situation where this financialized economy is creating such disorder on a global scale socially, politically, economically, that sooner or later all kinds of morbid symptoms, and we already see them everywhere, but these are going to intensify, all kinds of morbid symptoms are going to emerge and are going to make the situation more and more unmanageable. And at some point I think that even those in power are going to be looking for opportunities to stabilize the situation. And this I think can go two ways. This can go either the way of the far right, which seeks to reimpose order through a reassertion of the nation state, the reassertion of national borders, cracking down and scapegoating uh, and minorities and, and migrant communities. 
Uh, or it could go the other way, where you actually seek to establish a form of democratic control over finance and over the economy more generally. And that kind of approach, of course, depends on a much more significant mass mobilization and a much more significant social movement emerging in the years to come. Uh, I don't think that that's impossible. And very often you find that these movements emerge at times where you least expect them. And you can't really predict when they emerge with force. Uh, we all remember when the Arab Spring broke out or the European anti-austerity protests or the Occupy movement, for instance. Um, they come uh, unexpectedly and, and, and very suddenly and, and they may also disappear again. But I do think that we find ourselves in a different moment now where because of the repoliticization of these issues, there is a potential to now build on such mobilizations to create an organized political force that can actually begin to contest the power of finance from below. We've got a long way to go, but I definitely do think that that's where, I mean, that's where we have to go because what is the alternative?